Hey Nerdy Knitters, welcome to Knitting 411 episode number two where we answer your knitting questions. In this episode we're going to look at the five basic categories for cast on methods. Yes, you should know more than one way to cast on. We'll also look at what it means when a pattern tells you to increase at the beginning and end of a row. If the pattern doesn't specify how to do that, what you can do. And we'll also look at three different ways you can add a lace stitch pattern to any shawl shape that you like. Before we do that, let me just say, hey, I'm Tanya here at Nerdy Knitting. I'm a certified knitting instructor and a knitwear designer. And my goal is to help you become a confident, adventurous knitter. So even in this weekly podcast, we spend a little bit of time chatting about what we're knitting and working on, but it's really focused on helping you become more confident in your knitting adventures. I thought I'd start this episode by talking a little bit about my knitting journey. I didn't learn to knit until 2017. So I know many people learn to knit when they're young, their mothers or their grandmothers teach them. I did lots of crafts when I was a kid. I, I learned to crochet and I did embroidery. I, goodness, I even sewed all my own clothes one year in high school. I did lots of different crafts, but I never did learn to knit. My mom knit, she used to make us hats and mittens. I had mittens on those I-cord strings that went through your coat all the way through high school even. I couldn't get away from those things. I'm tempted to knit some of those for my daughter. I'm, I'm sure she'd love that now that she's 17, having her mittens attached to strings in her coat. But <laughs> I can't say I appreciated that when I was a teenager. But I wasn't a huge fan of them because I run warm, I guess, and my hands were always warm and the yarn always felt really clammy on my hands. And now I know it was, it was because of the type of yarn it was. No offense to my mom. She had a lot of kids to take care of. So acrylic yarn was inexpensive and she could make lots of mittens. But um, I prefer wool. Now that I have mittens knit in wool, I can, I can tell the difference and I really love them now. But no, I didn't learn to knit when I was a kid. I didn't learn till I was well, in my 40s, I'm not going to tell you how old, but <laughs> um, my sister-in-law knit and my mother-in-law knit and uh, my sister-in-law had just moved to the area and they would come over quite often for dinner and things like that with my in-laws. So I asked my sister-in-law if she would show me how and she told me to, what to go pick up. I picked up some, some double pointed needles and some dishcloth yarn and I was all excited because I thought it was such a good deal. You got those five needles in a case. And so I, I took two and I gave the other ones to my mother-in-law because I, I didn't realize I would need all of them eventually. But she t showed me how to cast on and work one of those dishcloths. Oh, I think I have it here somewhere. Yep, that's what I... The first thing I knit, oh, it's got a bad stain right there, but you can see, yeah, I had really terrible tension, <laughs> but that was my first project. And I knit piles and piles of those, and I just, I fell in love with knitting. There's just something so meditative about it, and I'm the type who likes to have something in my hands when I'm watching TV at night, and that just, it fit the bill. It was perfect. My hands were busy so I could watch TV and relax without just scrolling through Facebook or anywhere online. It felt, it made me feel more productive. But I also liked how challenging it could be. I just, I liked learning new techniques. I really dived into just like learning how to knit mittens and how to knit socks. I would try all these different sock heels, different, a different one every time I would knit another pair of socks and knitting two socks at a time and learning all those techniques. I, I just loved that I could challenge myself if I wanted to, but at the same time, if I just wanted to relax and knit garter stitch at night, working on a shawl, I could do that too. I just, I love that it's so, it's creative, but it's useful at the same time. So yes, I didn't learn to knit till just a few years ago. And, and I'm the type when I learn something, I, sort of just dive right in and I get a bit obsessive about it. And I found the Knitting Guild Association from Googling online and this master knitter thing. And that was intriguing to me. Um, so I signed up first for their, their, their basics course. I just wanted to make sure I had the basics down since I was still pretty new. I think that was probably just a few months after I'd started knitting, I signed up for that. And then within a few months, I'd finished that and I bought level one and I basically really learned everything I knew about knitting by applying it to that first level. And I finished that one within a year and then um, I bought level two right away. 
That one was more of a challenge. The first one I, I didn't find that difficult because I'd been doing so many different things and knitting socks and all these different techniques. But finishing techniques in level two, I'd only knit a few sweaters by the time I got to that level. So that was a real challenge because they focus heavily on finishing techniques and seaming. And honestly, when I, when I got my box back after level two, I can't remember, are there five or six different swatches you have to do for seaming? I had to send them all back because I did so bad. I had to redo every single one of them. But now I really, I can seam really well. I've learned how to do mattress stitch. Um, but yes, I guess, I guess it shows how obsessive I was. I just dived right into that. And then last year I, that I passed level two, I passed, I think in January. And I, I figured I had rushed right through those first two levels, doing them all in within two years that I needed to take a little break and I was in the middle of some personal things. I had um, run some websites. I, I homeschooled my daughter from, she's 17 now since, well, she's never been to school. We've always homeschooled. And when she was small, I started a small website about that and just connecting with other homeschool moms. And that sort of grew and became a, well, a, a part-time business basically. So I, but I'm almost done with that now. She's gonna be graduating next year. So I figured it was time to move on to other things. So I sold that website and I was feeling at loose ends and. And my husband's like, well, you love to teach and you love knitting, so why not do that? <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I thought about that and it, it really, I do, I like to teach. I've, I've loved homeschooling. And so I figured, well, I'm taking a break from the master knitting course. So, and by this time COVID was, was happening and we were stuck at home for a while. So I, I bought the knitting instructor course from the Knitting Guild Association and I worked through that and passed with flying colors. Um, I loved it, that was so much fun because well, I've always liked to make lesson plans, I'm a nerd. Um, and then once I finished that one, I just jumped right in and did the tech editing course too because I was still stuck at home, nothing to do. And I needed something to occupy my time. So I worked on that and finished that one too. That was a tough course, but I'm very glad I did it because it, it helps me now when I'm working on new designs um, I look at it with a different eye. Well, what, with one eye, I look at the design itself and just the knitting process. But then when I'm looking at the pattern, I'm looking at the math and how it reads and how to make it legible and understandable. So anyway, I did all of that this past year. And then I took a break from the Master Knitter Program. Jess bought that for Christmas. So I'm working on level three now, but I've basically been educating myself while I knit. I, I use it to relax, but I also I just love how challenging it is. So that's just a little history. I've only been knitting since 2017. So I know people are always like, oh, you know, you've been knitting for years and years, you know so much. And my, my mother-in-law laughs because she's been knitting since she was a kid, but she comes to me to show her how to do things because even though I've only been knitting a few years, I've sort of dived in and learned everything I can about it. I don't know everything, that's for sure. I'm still learning, master the, the level three is really kicking my butt right now. Um, but I love it. I enjoy it. And I'm guessing since you're here watching this and hopefully knitting, watching this, that you love knitting too. So I would love to hear your story. Were you young when you started knitting or were you older like me? I was in my forties. I'll say that much, <laughs> but I'd love to know when did you start your knitting journey? Okay. That's enough chit chat. Now I'll tell you what I've been working on. I've been working on the master's program where I'm on level three and there's a whole bunch of swatches, 19 of them that I have to do. So I've been working on those and sort of thinking about the hat I'm going to knit. We have to knit a sweater and a hat self-designed and knit. Um, and we have our, we have a choice. We can do one Fair Isle stranded project and one Aran project. And you have your choice. It could be an Aran hat, Fair Isle sweater or the other way around. And my daughter really wants a cable knit sweater. So that's going to be my final project. So it's going to be a fair ale tam for the hat. So I'm working on a tam right now just to get the basic construction down. So I found just a nice lacy rib pattern that I'm using for the brim of the hat. And then I did all my increases and I'm just working on the body of the hat now. That's what's on my needles at the moment before I dive into really working on the TAM. And the major portion of my week was on double knitting. This is the swatch I finished. 
Oh, I'm still not sure about this one. Um, the some of the swatches, it will tell you, it gives you gives you exact instructions on what they expect, and then other swatches, it will just give you a. Uh, like another one we have to do is for elongated stitches, but it will tell you to choose the stitch pattern and write a pattern to go with the swatch. But this one with the double knitting, they gave us um, the pattern that we had to follow, which included the gauge, um, which if you didn't know for double knitting, you use a lot smaller needles than you normally would. Like this, is, I'm using worsted weight yarn, so it's usually seven or eight that I would use. But I went down to, a, the pattern called for a four, and I thought that was really, really going to be too tight but it wasn't at all I actually went down the four was the my stitch gauge was still too big so I had to go down I think I went down another half a millimeter then it was a little too tight so then I had to go back up oh my word I've spent I think I've done five five of these swatches this week oh, I've got a few of them here Oops. yes I've been working double knitting swatches <laughs> all week long but I've really noticed my edge stitches. Um, I always have a little trouble with the left edge. They always get a little bit loose. I don't know. My, I think it's because the yarn gets carried across the row and the more you work those stitches, all that excess yarn ends up at the end. I think from what I understand and what I read that I think that's what's happening. So I'm trying and I really notice it on this double knitting, the swatches I've worked and I notice it less when I use circular knitting needles, so I think something about having them sit on the cable keeps them from stretching out. I'm not quite sure. I've worked three or four of those double knitting swatches, and I think this one really came out well. My stitch gauge is perfect, but my row gauge, I have one extra row than I should, so I'm trying to figure out what I should do to adjust that. If you have any ideas, let me know. I'm not quite sure if I should try a different type like needle material to see if that would make a change or I don't know I might just send it in the way it is and maybe I'll pass I don't know I don't know how that works like if they're going to be really a stickler about that row gauge we'll see I still have to figure out what I'm going to do and my other swatch that I've been working on this week um, it was one of those they don't give you a pattern they just tell you to they give you some guidelines about picking a smocking stitch which was new to me I'd never heard of smocking stitch before this is just one way. It's usually worked over a rib pattern. It's just two by two rib. And then all you do is you take your right needle and you move over, in this case, it was six stitches in from the edge, six stitches in on the left needle and insert like you're going to knit, wrap the yarn, pull that big loop through, put it on the left needle and then knit it together with the first stitch on the needle. And that wraps those stitches. It creates that little smock. I think it's really pretty. I think that would look really nice on a hat. So I've got wheels turning. That's what the back looks like. I think that's interesting too. Sort of like some kind of a basket weave. But so I still, the swatch is done and that one was fun. I plan to do it on a size seven and I accidentally grabbed a size six needle and I thought this feels really tight and my hands were hurt because hurting because I, well, I, my, my knit two pearl two rib it can be sloppy too so I try to make adjustments and knit a bit tighter on that second knit stitch to so they're not so overly large and I was really my hands were sore I was knitting the whole thing way too tight then I realized it was on the wrong size needles so I did it again with a size 7 and the swatches are supposed to be within certain dimensions and mine was just within the boundaries on the small side so I ripped that one out and I went up to a size 8 and it came out good so Three, three tries for this one and I finally got what I liked. So I've got to write the pattern for that one still. But that's it for the master knitting stuff. Okay, for upcoming videos, I finished this scarf. It still needs to be blocked. I want to block out the rib so it lays flat like the rest of it. It's just four different stitch patterns and oh, some dog hair. Um, but the goal of the video is to teach how to read knitting instructions and read charts, but sometimes knitting instructions can be written different ways. So I thought I'd do a video that shows you what the differences are and how to read them basically. And then I prefer scarves over cowls, so I knit a scarf. And I also finished another scarf. There won't be a tutorial for this. It's just a, a stitch pattern I found that I really liked. And it's just that repeated over and over again. So. 
the pattern. I have it written. I just need to get it all typed up and pretty looking. And that one is going to be a free pattern because it was just one chart. I didn't do anything special to it. So I will let you know when that's available if you want to download that. And I do have another pattern that was just released on Knitty this week for the Satura Cowl. This is using a Malabrigo yarn. I really like their yarn. I love those colors, but it's just a really simple slip stitch pattern. I'll put a link down below for this. It's a free pattern on Nini. It was just released. There, that's it for what I've been working on. And the next thing I'm tackling, I'm going to finish up that tam and then start getting a rough idea of the, the Fair Isle tam I'm going to knit for my master's level program. And I'm gonna focus on some of the first few swatches I had skipped because I was waiting for a reference book from the library. Some different um, increases and decreases, which aren't too complicated, but one of the other things we have to do with the swatches is to showcase different cast on and bind off methods. So I was waiting for this book to come, which I, I think I've gotten like three or four or five times from the library now. I really just need to buy it myself because it's just, it's a really good book. I like how clear the explanations are. She's got it split into two different sections. The first section is your cast, cast on sections. And she has them divided up into all purpose and ribbing and end of row, decorative, toe up socks, temporary hems. And then the bind off section too is divided basic, stretchy, decorative, sewn. So I will be studying that this week because I have five swatches where I have to showcase some of these cast on and bind off techniques. I've got a list narrowed down, I think, of what I'll be using. But that's my homework for the week, that and working on my TAM getting this pattern ready and published. All right, that's it for what I've been working on. I guess it's time to jump into our questions. Our first one is the community question from last week. Philip's question, he wanted to know about different sock heels. Well, I guess we don't have any sock knitters watching because I only got one comment for his question. Knit Bits shared her answer. She said she likes the look of an afterthought heel the most, but they don't fit her even though she has a low arch, or her husband, he has a high arch, um, the fabric of the instep feels too tight. So she prefers the fit of a heel flap and gusset and a flegal heel, which I think also has sort of a gusset, so that might be why it fits better. And both of those fit her husband's high arched foot as well. And she also likes the recipe of Sockmetician's toe ups because he's a bit of a math nerdy guy himself. With his recipe, you can make these socks fit really well based on a number that you calculate. That's interesting. I don't know anything about that, so I'm going to have to look into that. I really like the sound of a recipe for a sock. And she has tried German Short Rose and the Fish Lips Kiss heel, I think, but they don't fit as high at, they don't, but she doesn't rate the fit as high as the normal flap and gusset. So that's interesting. So I think heels probably depends on the arch, the width of your foot maybe, and the, the arch of the foot if you have a high arch. Or maybe like, I don't know what the measurement's called, where it's the back of the heel and around to the instep, like it's sort of a diagonal. Maybe it depends on that, like if you have a lot of width there. I'm not sure. I'm sure somebody's researched this. I just haven't, but I'm guessing that the way the heel fits depends on how your foot is shaped in those different places. I think we're gonna save this question and ask it again. Maybe in the future we'll have more sock knitters and they'll be able to help us with this. We did have two questions related to cast on techniques this week. This first one from Kathy, who always uses the slingshot cast on. It's her favorite, but what is it best used for? Now slingshot cast on, I think that's the same as long tail cast on. That's my assumption, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, that one is a great all-purpose cast on. It's just stretchy enough to be used for your hems and your cuffs on different things. The only thing to remember with that one is that it is, each side looks different. Like usually that smooth side people like to use for the front of their work, which means you have to work a wrong side row first to get that on the front. But it's possible to work it in pattern as well. So you can get that combination of knits and pearls if you want. It's a great cast on for when you need something elastic, when you just want a nice finished edge, it's really a good, it's my go-to for my all-purpose cast on. Now the second question we had is from Karen. She's seen a few different cast on methods on YouTube and she wants to know the advantages to using one over another. 
And she's absolutely right. There are advantages to using certain cast on methods. Now this, the slingshot long tail cast on, that is a great one for an all purpose, good elasticity cast on, but sometimes you want something different. Sometimes you want a stretchy cast on or bind off like for the brim of a hat or the cuff on a mitten or the hem of a sweater, you want something stretchy. Or sometimes you want something that's not so stretchy, say on the edge of a scarf that's all cabled. You want that end of that scarf to stay firm and straight. You don't want a stretchy bind off. You want something that's a little more firm and non-elastic. So all of our cast ons and bind offs fall within those two categories. They can either be firm basic or they can be more elastic but then we can break them down even further this list right here shows you the five basic categories that i personally break them up into you can really divide them up any way you want but besides elastic and non-elastic there's a few other times you might want a different cast on perhaps you want something a little more decorative like a pico cast on or bind off or one of those braids where it's multicolored, two and three color braids along the edge of a hem. Those are really pretty. Now, number four is an interesting category, invisible cast-ons and bind-offs. We could put the sewn bind-off in here because when you work that, it's fairly invisible. Things in this category could be something like a tubular cast-on and bind-off because it looks a lot like what you'd see on a machine knit sweater where that hem just rolls right under and there's no visible cast-on edge. But there's other ways to create those invisible lines. You can use cast-ons that are labeled invisible cast-ons where you don't really see that cast-on edge that you would for like a long tail cast-on or cable cast-on. Or you can take those cast-ons, the long tail and the cable cast-on will both do this, and you can cast them on in pattern where you can combine the knits and the pearls to create that first row, especially if you're working a rib, so it looks almost invisible. It's not quite, but it's close to an invisible cast on. Last on our list are provisional and closed cast on methods. Now these types of cast ons are things you'll see when you're knitting toe up socks. You start with like Judy's magic cast on, that's a closed cast on. You start with a toe working your way up. Or if you're knitting a shawl, but you want both ends to be exactly the same. So you start perhaps in the middle and work your way out from the middle of the shawl to both ends. You'd want a provisional cast on so you can cast on in both directions, or you can use that for a toe up sock as well. When you do a short row toe, you can use a provisional cast on, or you might want a closed cast on if you're knitting something from the center out, like a lace doily or something like that. So those are our five basic categories. If I could recommend just one cast on method, I would say the slingshot, or long tail cast on method. It's fairly elastic, it looks nice. You can work it in pattern so you get a, what looks like knits and pearls across the bottom of the row. So that's probably more than you wanted to know about different cast on methods, but I think it's a good idea to have them broken down into their different methods. So you can really think about even the cast on you use is an, can be an important choice in your knitting project. Our next question is from Carmen. How can you keep your pattern stitch when you're knitting a triangle shawl? Color work or lace pattern stitch? I mean the shawl that has increasing down the middle. I'm assuming she means a top down triangle shawl and it is possible to add a stitch pattern to it. I know it's really easy to just do some stripes and some color work and change colors, but you can add a stitch pattern. The, the first thing you need to do is get some kind of charting software. Even if it's just graph paper and a pencil, something you can chart on. It's really important because that's really the best way to try to get stitch patterns into the shape of the shawl you want to work on. I've used Stitch Fiddle. That one does have a small yearly fee you can pay, but it's not necessary. They have a free option too, and it works perfectly fine. I use a paid option now. Since I'm a designer, it just made more sense to have something that I could download and use all the time. It's called Stitch Mastery. There's also a few other options available. Chartminder and Knitbird are two options that I've found. I don't have any experience with them, but any of these, you just wanna get one of these programs, give them a try. Now, the first thing you want to do when you have your charting software and you've had some time to play around with it is to chart out the shape of the shawl you're going to make. Like this chart right here. This is if you were going to chart out a top-down triangle shawl, this is what it would look like. You can see along each edge, it's got garter stitch, three stitches of garter stitch. Right in the middle is that center spine stitch. And then the body of the shawl is those two triangles. You start with just one stitch and then you're increasing along each edge. So you get four increases every right side row. 
and that gives us the shape of a top-down triangle shawl. Now the first way to add a stitch pattern to a shawl is to wait until you have enough stitches to accommodate one full repeat of the stitch pattern. Now if you look at this example here, I've only taken half of that top-down triangle shawl. You can see one garter edge and then the spine stitch over there on the left side because it's just going to be a duplicate for the other side. It would just, it was easier to map it out this way. So in this first example, we're waiting and not adding more repeats until we have enough stitches to accommodate each repeat. The red box shows the stitch pattern repeat itself. I just repeated it in that central panel until I had enough stitches across to accommodate more repeats of that pattern. So that's the easiest method. You'll just keep working your background stitch, whether it's stockinette, garter, or something else, until you have enough stitches in that space to accommodate another repeat of that pattern. But if you don't like all that empty space, you can see on each side, there's quite a lot of just plain stockinette in there. You can do the second me method, which is fill in with your basic pattern, but then add in partial repeats of the stitch pattern where they'll fit. Now this screen recording shows how I did that. I would copy one small portion of the pattern, one little repeat, and then paste it in in the same spot where it would fit below, and then repeated that on the other side. Just copying and pasting. And then I still had more space I could fill in, so I copied the row underneath that. Pasted it down underneath and you just have to pay attention to where those stitches fit make sure they're lining up properly this is kind of a tedious process but you can see how it fills in the one thing you want to pay attention to especially in this instance is don't confuse the yarn overs for the lace stitch pattern with the yarn overs you're using to create the shape of your shawl it can be very simple to to look at a yarn over at the edge and think that it's part of the stitch pattern repeat when really it is part of what's constructing the shape of your shawl. So you want to be aware of whatever increase you're using that it stays outside of that boundary. And then you would just continue this process. As you can see, it's a little bit tedious, but you would stop and look and add in as much of that pattern as you could and fill in some of that empty space. Now the last method would be the overall stitch pattern. You want as many stitches from your lace stitch pattern or whatever it is to be in the body of the shawl. The easiest way to do this is to chart that out first. Chart out that repeat. If you look here, I just took that basic stitch pattern and I just filled the whole chart with it first. And then what you'll do is sort of reverse engineer this. You're going to put the shape of your shawl over the stitch pattern and just delete those extra spaces that you don't need. So this is where you have to understand the construction of the particular shawl that you're working on because you're going to need to know how to do that to remove the stitches. The first thing to do is look at the very center. Where do you want that stitch pattern to be centered? So once you find the center of that pattern, you'll grab that gray no stitch and you're going to remove the stitches that are around it. And for our triangle shawl construction, that starts with three stitches. We've got our one knit stitch and then a yarn over at each side. So I'm charting that right over the stitch pattern. And then the wrong side row, it's three stitches. And then you go back and with this particular pattern, I, you just remove one less stitch from each, each side. And then you look at what's left and you have to make a decision about what's there. You need to add your shaping for the shawl shape itself. As you can see here, I'm gonna to have to remove those stitches because I need to put in yarn overs for the shawl shape. So I'm not gonna be able to keep that, that particular repeat of the pattern. So I have to remove those. This can all be, this is also a slightly tedious process, but for a full all over lace pattern or any other pattern, this is really the, I think it's the easiest way to add it in. There, that's another two rows, but I still have to add the shaping for the shawl itself and that there's not enough stitches to accommodate that yet. So I have to replace the stitch pattern here. This is the important thing to remember that your, your shawl shape has to come first and then the stitch pattern can be added in after. 
Now here we go. In this section, it looks like we can start getting some of that shape right in there. But you'd have to make a decision right here. You can see you're working double yarn overs right there. So you'd have to decide, do you want to keep those double yarn overs? Or if you decide to remove the lace stitch yarn over, you have to remove the decrease as well. But you could keep the central decrease and the yarn over on either side just fine. But it really, it's up to you whether you want to keep that or not. And as you can see, you just continue this process, removing those stitches and adding in the yarn overs or whatever increase you're using to create the shawl shape. That's really all there is to it. You want to get some kind of charting software or graph paper, find a stitch pattern you like, and then use one of these methods. You can either wait until you have enough stitches to accommodate each repeat. You can add in partial repeats in there as well. Or if you're really feeling ambitious, chart out a big section of the pattern and then put your shape for your shawl over the top to get as much of those pattern stitches in there as possible. Our last question's from Paula. She wants to know how to make increases at the beginning and end of a purl row. There's three basic steps to this process and sometimes referred to as paired increases or decreases or mirrored increases or decreases. The first rule is that they need to be worked on the same row. So if you're working them on a right side row or a wrong side row, it doesn't matter. You'll work one at one end, you'll work one at the other end. The next rule is that they should lean in opposite directions. Now, most increases and decreases have a noticeable slant. A knit two together leans off to the right. Its pair is usually an SSK, and that leans off to the left. If you were increasing, you could work a make one right, and its pair would be a make one left. Those are paired because they lean in opposing directions. And the final rule is that they are worked at the same location at opposite ends. So if you work an increase two stitches in from your right edge, you're going to work the paired increase two stitches in from the left edge. So let's look at our example. Our pattern doesn't tell us how to work them. We can make a choice. I might decide I'm going to knit a stitch, work a make one right. So that means I'll work to the end of the row. I'll work a make one left and then knit the final stitch. They are paired because they're on the same row. They lean in opposite directions and they're both one stitch in from the edge. And notice, I didn't say that I was working these um, in stockinette or on reverse stockinette because you can work a make one right and left in pearl fabric too. So you can work that on a pearl row. My only other consideration would be is if I'm going to be um, seaming the garment, I don't like to work my increases and decreases right along that edge because sometimes it can get in the way of getting a really nice mattress stitch seam. So I'll move them in by two stitches. So they're still along the edge, so they're not noticeable, but they're not in the way of seaming the project either. This swatch shows these rules in action. Their make one increases worked a few stitches in from the edge and they lean in opposite directions. And you can see that they are mirrored or paired. So there, those are our three questions for the week. And we have one more, our community question, where I need your help answering. This one's from Rachel. She loves making socks, especially toe up short row socks like sock meticians, but no matter whatever method she chooses, she always gets a loose stitch on each side when she resumes knitting in the round. Why does this happen and how can she avoid it? So if you have any tips about those loose stitches, I know we all get them, I still do. I'm, I haven't found a good solution yet. I'm still working on that. But if you have some advice for Rachel, please leave a comment. Just look, if you scroll down, look for the comments. There's a pinned comment and it's her question right there and you can reply right underneath so she can see your answers. And I'll read them next week to see what, you, what advice you have to give for this loose stitch sock question. Now for the next episode, I need your help. I need you to leave your questions that I can answer in our next video. So you can leave those down below, leave a comment with your question, or hop on over to the community tab of the Nerdy Knitting YouTube page. And if you look for this picture on that community page, you can leave your question right underneath. It will have the date and the time for the next episode. Those are the two places that I try to look for questions every time. So be sure to leave your questions for me to answer. And if you have some advice for Rachel, please answer our community question down below as well. That loose stitch when you start knitting in the round on your sock heels. Have you found a solution for that? We'd love to know about it. 
If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe if you like to get nerdy with your knitting.